You know, when I started being a boxing fan in the 1970s, my dad would inform me of all the great fighters that he followed or he thought deserved a better chance at world title recognition. Now, this fighter holds two wins against George Cavallo, one against Cleveland Williams, and, and victories against immediate opponents. Was a top 10 contender for almost more than a half decade, but yet never got a shot to the world crown. Now, you're saying to yourself, why would he not get a, get a shot where he's 48-6-1, right out of Montreal again, won uh, two Canadian heavyweight titles against Chevallo in the key head-to-head -head matches, and Chevallo being a top 10 fighter as well. Now, Bob Clarou, uh big drink of water, 6'2", uh, probably 215 at his best weight, basically... Uh, came on the scene after the, the Yvonne Durrell situation and also before George Chavallo really got worldwide recognition. Now, in an article on CyberBoxingZone.com by Joe Krause, he said he was a star in an era of superstars, and maybe that's why he never got a, uh, got a shot. Now, uh, Krause in the article said, would 48-6-1, 38 KOs usually be noticed in the history of boxing? Would wins over many highly rated fighters usually be noticed? Would the fact that his fighter was never stopped make a difference? It should make a difference, and he should be remembered as a great heavyweight. And again, he, uh, it's all about Bob Clarou. Now, in 57, uh, he began his career by knocking out Ray Beatty in his hometown in four rounds. By the end of 59, Clarou was poised to break into the top tier of heavyweights with a record of 17-1-1 with 15 knockouts. His only loss came against a more experienced Buddy Thurman, who had a 30-5, 23-KO KO record at the time. Now, this was his 14th fight. Now, in 1960, Clarou burst upon the scene with some big wins. His first one, one incision, or Willie Besmanoff, a future Ali opponent. Then, five months later, won the biggest fight to date by knocking out former title contender Roy Harris in the fifth round. This put Clarou in position to fight for the Canadian heavyweight title, and of course his opponent that night was Hall of Fame, Fame inductee George Chevallo. Now, a lot of people were questioning why Chevallo took the fight because Clarou uh, was extremely dangerous on the inside, could build up points. Now, Clarou did that. He was able to win a 12-round decision, still don't know why the fight wasn't 15 rounds, and when it moved in the top 10. Now, Clarou uh, got a uh, revenge win against Buddy Thurman, uh, by winning him in the second round via KO before facing Chevallo for the second time in 1960 on November 23rd. This time, Chevallo won a 12-round decisive decision and handed Clarou's uh, second loss. At the end of 1960, Bob was ranked number 7 by the ring, uh, but 1961 again was a better year. He began by knocking out former top 10 contenders Harold Carter, Roy Harris, and Alex Mateff in Montreal. He then defeated Chevallo in the rubber match of the three fight series to win back the Canadian title. Now, at the end of 61, he was a number five ranked heavyweight in the world with a record of 28 2 and 1 with 23 knockouts. Now, a lot of people were saying if uh, Clarou could win a couple more fights, he would be poised for a title shot. He first won uh, by seven round KO over top 10 ranked heavyweight George Rogan before facing a very tough opponent in Zora Folly on April 18, 62. Folly was also uh, always poised for a title shot himself, but was passed by uh, for less accomplished fighters time and time again. Claire Rue lost a decisive 10 round decision to Folly and was unable to move to the top of the rankings. Another loss to world ranked Mike Dijon temporarily halted the move up the rankings, but a well winner over former title contender Todd McNeely kept Bob ranked number 7 going in 1963. Now, after four knockouts over average uh, opposition in uh, Montreal, Clarou again met Foley in a rematch this time in Montreal. Foley won, once again won a 10-round decision, and Clarou left the sport uh, disgruntled for four years. In 68, he came back and defeated uh, former Ali opponent Cleveland Big Cat Williams by decision. It was on a nine-fight winning streak before being derailed by Billy Joyner on July 31st, 69. Now, uh, 
what uh, it says on Cyber Boxing Journal, I tend to agree. We think of Canadian boxing for the heavyweights in the 60s. Where uh, words and thoughts go to Chevalo. But Claru, with the two wins over Chevalo, should have deserved him a better chance. To my knowledge, he, was, he didn't fight for the Commonwealth crown or wasn't considered, and at the time, Ali was too busy with his world tour to worry about a Canadian that was already retired. And of course, he already fought Chevalo in Canada in his first uh, reign. Now, a lot of people said because Chevalo knocked off Jerry Corey around that same era, it put more attention on Chevalo's toughness than Clarou being in retirement and coming out. Although it made, uh, it made big news that he bet uh, Big Cat Williams, he never had a big fight to many to, for the American public to take notice. In Canada, we recognize his toughness, just like Yvonne Durrell when he took on Chevalo, and Durrell was uh, also fighting uh, various international opponents in very uh, you know decisive fashion. Now, his biggest fights were against, uh, again, Farley, Williams, and Harris, and uh, he, if he couldn't beat Zora Farley, and Farley, uh, Farley, Zora lost later on to Ali. Uh, but for, for like my dad said, Clarou was a, bad, uh, was a great fighter, but he was caught in the, the numbers game. There was Liston, there was Machen, there was Ali, there was Patterson, Archie Moore was still around. Most of the, uh, the big fights weren't involving George Chevalo until uh, Chevalo had that last fight against Clarou. And uh, Chevalo went on that international tour where he was fighting every contender under the book. He was winning 70% of those fights. He lost a few tough fights. But Chevalo was more of a darling of Madison Square Garden of the New York press than Clarou was. And uh, because Chevalo had more of an interesting story because being kind of of the immigrant experience, where Claru is mostly sort of like Yvonne Durrell uh, of the Acadian side. You know, it's hard to make a Quebec Quebecois superstar. Durrell became a Quebecois superstar, but because he was an Acadian superstar to begin with. But I, rem I remember watching some of his fights, and like I said, his, his hand speed was great, his physicality was uh, great. To beat George Fowler twice in pretty well his prime, where everything everything was on Chevalo's advantage, uh, reach, strength, uh, power punches, but Clarou, again, uh, a knockout artist at times, but a good defensive fighter, but always one step away from the next level. Maybe they had different uh, different key fights, maybe uh, not say uh, as we say. Uh, fixed fights, but fights against international are recognized. You should have put him up against maybe more of the international fighters, not from the States, or maybe somebody from uh, Mexico, to see what I would do. How we, how we would do. But two-time Canadian champ, uh, again, uh, a top five Canadian boxer of the 1960s, and that's saying a lot. There was quite a few good ones. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the, the short story and the uh, the kind of curious case of Bob Clarou. If you like what we're doing here with our boxing podcast, give us a like, comment, or subscribe. And don't forget, 1960s in the uh, boxing scene had international hometown heroes like Chevalo, Henry Cooper, Brian London, uh, uh, some of the Italian and German and uh, you know European title holders. There was a lot of good fighters. But like I said... If you were top 10 in the 1960s in a ring magazine ratings, you had to be good. Because if you had the three belts in the 1960s, Clarou would probably have one. Or like the WBO with the fourth belt like we have now. So thanks for listening. Happy Labor Day. Bye.